In the world of medicine, where every decision can change lives, your peace of mind is crucial. This is where Pattern steps in. Imagine insurance made simple, fast, and personalized just for you. With Pattern, you're not just getting disability and life insurance, you're insuring your future and protecting your greatest asset, your income. In the past 10 years, Pattern has transformed the way over 20,000 doctors secure their financial well-being. Discover the simplicity of securing your future at PatternLife.com or click the link in the description. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On this week's episode, we have a guest host. So please be the same respectful audience you are for me and enjoy. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Imagine this. Imagine that you're one of 30 million Americans and you're a medically disadvantaged American and you're getting your care through what we call a safety net clinic. Now, these are staffed by primary care doctors, family physician doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners, and they're pretty well staffed with those people, but they do not have any, they have very minimal access to specialists like GI people or cardiologists or neurologists. So imagine yourself, you're a clinician and you're seeing one of your patients and they have a problem, a dermatology problem or a GI problem or whatever. And you want to get some help on this patient. And it is going to take you three, you know that the backup is challenged that you're going to have to wait three to four months to get your patient seen. Imagine yourself that you're a patient And you've seen this PA or you've seen your family doctor and he doesn't exactly know what's going on and he tells you it's going to be three months before you can see a specialist. Imagine yourself in that situation. Today, we are really privileged to have Dr. Lori Green here because she has made an attempt to solve that problem. And now, if you're working as a clinician in one of these specialty clinics, you have a way, you have access to getting specialty consultations for one of these for one of these patients within hours. They don't have to make to wait three to four months and all the anxiety. So Dr. Lori Green, welcome. You have envisioned and you are the founder of what we call Mavenproject.org. Dr. Lori Green, what is Maven Project? Tell us what this is. Good morning, and thank you for having me. So MAVEN actually stands for Medical Alumni Volunteer Expert Network. And of course, the word MAVEN means to share knowledge. It all started back in 2014 when a group of medical school alumni leaders uh, were looking for capstone projects um, for our alumni councils and our alumni associations. We were thinking about what could we do for a fellow alumni? And at that moment, the Affordable Care Act was about to be implemented. And most alumni councils for medical schools have a diverse group of counselors. Some are clinicians, some are researchers, and they span every field you can imagine. And we all came together and said, you know, we recognize that with the Affordable Care Act, individuals across the nation would suddenly be insured when they had not been up until that point. Yet, Having insurance did not confer access. And as Dr. Abramson said, there are 30 million people who may be insured. They may have Medicaid. They may have a health plan that from one of the state exchanges that has such a high deductible that they cannot afford to even pay their portion of their health care bills. And so we recognized there were a group of individuals of our alumni. We called it the Silver Tsunami because there were quite a few alumni who uh, were uh, about to retire, but still wanted to participate, still wanted to give back. And then there was the need. And the third component that was so important was technology. And I have to say, back in 2013, 2014, telehealth was a nascent industry. Many people felt telehealth would fail. And we recognized that we could link, we could be match.com meets the Peace Corps. We could link these volunteers 
with the clinicians that Dr. Averson s- describes, many of them and these clinics, you know, safety in a clinic are, there are 2,800 of them in the country. They're scattered throughout the nation. There are rural, they are, you know, core urban locations. But the characteristic is that they are extremely culturally competent and they serve populations, immigrant populations, the working poor. And they are the primary site for care for this 30 million population, 80% of whom actually work. And we recognize that the clinicians in these clinics were many of them, freshly minted doctors. They were nurse practitioners and physician assistants who get 5% the clinical training that a physician gets before they're literally released into the wild. And so we recognize that technology could connect our volunteers to these clinicians in, in, in a way that isn't just an exchange of medical information, because there are companies that do that, but really in a relationship. So the Bayman Project recruits specialists, although we also have primary care providers. And we not only just exchange medical information, but we mentor and we educate at the level of the clinician. And then, of course, we give the medical advice to the primary care providers taking care of the most medically disadvantaged, underserved individuals in this country. And that was the point to bring together technology, volunteerism, and need. Wow. And, and, and I can tell you this, and, I, and full disclosure, I've been a volunteer for MAVEN as, as volunteer neurologist uh, for the last five years. And it has been, and it has been so rewarding. And I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to all put in my two cents about what this is, has meant for me and other volunteers too. You know, you talked about the relationship between the clinicians there and the volunteers. Can you speak more about that, the relationship that's developed? Sure, Absolutely. Well, I think all of us who practice medicine there were like the opposite of law. The most respected lawyer expert in a field has to do case law research before writing an opinion. And in medicine, there's this sense that you should know it all. And when you put clinicians in a setting where everyone is running wild, everyone has a cram schedule, it's not like you can pull on the shirt sleeve of the most senior doctor in your clinic and ask for advice. So between the sense that we should know all of this and the fact that you don't necessarily have people around, the the day of the curbside consult with all of the stresses and volume everyone needs to see, those days have passed. And um, then if anybody in the audience has tried to use up to date, I'm sure you realize that you just want to bang your head into the wall because you can't get a simple answer out of up to date, even on the most simple questions. Yeah. So the relationship part of what we do has to do with the fact that the clinicians, especially the clinicians in these settings, really don't, they're having to learn the art of medicine. Mm-hmm. And they also have limited education on the science. And so how do you make sure that a clinician understands that not only are you accessible, but that no question is too small? The idea that there is a safe place where you can get the information you need, and not only that, but you can get it in an efficient, pragmatic, clinically oriented way. I mean, all of us have have sat in the classroom and there's a point at which the mechanism of action of a given medication isn't as important as walking away knowing what the drug interactions will be or how you can get into trouble. And so much medical education is weighted down. It, part of it is the people who teach, right? Because academicians see a bigger picture and often they have a niche where they can get into great detail. But when you have to get through 30 patients in a day, and frankly, that's I'm an OBGYN, but I do a lot of primary care and I have, I see 30 to 35 patients a day. So there's this feeling you have that you really need to get an answer and you want to get it quickly and you want to get it in an actionable form. And so the relationship component really is that the volunteer is someone the clinician knows. It isn't some faceless person eating a sandwich and writing a consultation at their lunch hour. And the education in particular, and Dr. Abramson has been very involved in not just some of the lectures that give you the basics of EKGs or rheumatology or what test to order, but also, you know, there was a wonderful lecture 
don't get furious, get curious how to deal with a difficult patient. We have several you know, tips of how you get through the day. So I think this is what makes Maven unique. I, I'm sure anyone who's ever gotten a consult out of their field, you know, you get these consultations and there are all these abbreviations you don't know. And it's yeah. like, oh my God, I'm looking up in Google. Yeah. What's it mean? You know, I want to know. I look at things like some of the um, transesophageal echoes. It really, it's so frustrating. And the Maven yeah. Project erases all of that. Can yeah. you imagine? We all, when, in, in this era, which is so different from what it was 40 years ago when I first started, you know, in this era, you've got to cut to the chase and you have to be able to ask questions. And I yes. think that this, the ideal environment for that to happen in a successful way is the way we've structured the Maven Project. Yeah, it certainly is. You, and, and let me just reemphasize some of the things you said, because I've been like on the front lines on, on doing these things. And as a volunteer, you know, we're tired of old people and uh, we got a lot of time on our hands. So when we get one of these consults, it comes by an e-consult and we can really have a thoughtful response. And we have, you know, 30, 40 years of wisdom to give to these people. And so it's not just something we're just you know, writing off in 30 seconds, like a lot of times what you would do if you were in practice, but we can be thoughtful and we can be empathetic knowing what these people are up against. The other, and the other way, as you mentioned, Lori, that the way that we help these people is that we also provide lectures, is that we on basically in topics of our, of our expertise, we will develop lectures and give these to, and open these up to all these clinics. And I was just looking on the Maven website today. And, and so I just found this. So for this week, here are the lectures that we are offering. By the way, how many clinics are, how many clinics does Maven have is connected to them? We're in 25 states in DC. We have nearly 400 clinic sites. Wow. And yeah. a lot of these are in urban and core areas, inner cities, Appalachia, things like that. 400 clinics. And, and so each one of these clinics, all the clinicians have access to us. So just, I'm just, I was just, in, I looked on the Maven website. And so for this week, here are the lectures that we're offering to these people. August 13th, assessment of abnormal liver test. Another one on August 13th, later on the day is EKG mini series number two, ischemia and other ST abnormalities. August the 14th, hypertension update. Number, August number 14th, later on in the day, chest pain in children. And on August 16th, evidence-based management of acne. So this is a typical week where not only are we offering specific consults, but we're offering these lectures that we do. And in addition, and I think you touched on this, the other thing that we offer is mentoring. And so we offer one-to-one -one mentoring on these people, these clinicians that are working in these underserved clinics, and they may be having trouble with work-life balance, maybe dealing with leadership, maybe with how to become a leader. And we have a whole group of mentors that offer ourselves to, to work with these folks. And it's, uh, and I think that we really, in that way, we also offer a lot to these clinicians. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And in fact, the lectures are on our YouTube channel. I, I was looking at Dr. Schulman, who's an emeritus Harvard Medical School cardiologist, just gave a wonderful one, plug, plug, about hypertension. And yeah. the slides are, are fantastic. He starts out with the story of FDR. And that was remarkable. The blood pressure he had and the GI bleed he had. I mean, words, not only are these lectures to the point with actionable information, but they're engaging and they're amusing. And, you know, they're the kind of lectures that you leave, you know, with the information in your head. In other words, it's education that sticks. Yeah. And I wish I had time to listen to every Maven lecture. The slides, by the way, for people who are interested are quite good. And you can basically follow the lecture through the slides, but they are terrific. I, I really think we could have a whole medical school uh, for clinicians, especially for advanced practice clinicians, based on the dossier of, of lectures we have as it is. And again, it covers a wide range of topics, including how to get through your day, but also virtually every specialty you can imagine. So we do have the lecture list and, it, it, and every one of these lectures is, is tops. And I, I will say that the volunteers get fantastic ratings on every parameter. 
4.85 out of 5 for the work that they're doing. So there's a great deal of satisfaction. I think on both sides, because I think the generation of physicians, in, in which I'm a part, I got out of medical school in 76. And, you know, we all had medicine as a core part of our identity. Sometimes it, it was our identity. And suddenly, and, and what really struck me and why I, I was uh, motivated to start the Naven Project was that I had been away from my medical school for quite some time and went back on a listening tour. And people I venerated in medical school, many of the academicians who had taught me, were being unceremoniously shown the door because their chair or their professorship needed to be given to a, a, a young individual where our institution was competing for that person. And so it, it struck me that some of these individuals were really kind of lost, kind of at sixes and sevens, thinking about what to do next. And I think the Maven Project has revitalized so many individuals. I've heard so much positive feedback because a lot of our, our volunteers you know, meet. Many are people who have retired from Kaiser, so they have a Kaiser organization they're part of as well. And we even had a group that wrote a book about humanity and art. And they came together and put together a book that I, you can actually get on Amazon, as you can get Plug Plug, one yep. book that Scott wrote called Bedside Manners, humorous, warm, fantastic recollections. And it's what you compiled, really, that I think constitutes the wisdom of medicine. And the years it took to accumulate that wisdom is now being shared with people who are really at the dawn of their careers rather than the end. So there's a real generational pass-through that I do not think happens in other clinical settings. It's the end of another busy day. You just saw 20, 30 patients, maybe more. Instead of heading home for dinner with your spouse or playing with your kids, you now begin your night job, charting. Charting is critical for patient care, billing, and medical legal liability, but it steals our focus from our patients, eats away at our time with our families, and keeps us up at night. The burden of always having another chart to complete drains all of us. Freed listens, prepares your notes, and writes patient instructions for you. Charting is done before your patient walks out of the room. Wait, because it gets better. Freed learns your style over time. It's AI, just like a human scribe would, except it will never quit on you. Freed is loved by 3,000 plus clinicians from every specialty. It's HIPAA compliant, takes 30 seconds to learn, and costs only $99 a month. You can try Freed for free right now by going to freed.ai, F-R-E-E-D dot A-I. Listeners of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring can use the code PGD50 for $50 off the first month. Lori, I just want to say that that what you mentioned is the that not only is this of such value to the clinicians and the patients in these underserved clinics, but to us as volunteers. And you're right. You know, we've had 30, 40 years of wisdom and we retire. And not only do we not feel useful, but we've lost our family, you know, because our family was the people we have coffee with in the morning and talk about all this stuff. But this is what Maven has done, I think, for volunteers and rekindle that feeling of being useful. So we're not only doing consults, we're doing mentoring, but as we prepare these lectures or as we prepare our consults, we have to keep up to date. I mean, we have to keep sharp and learn what's the latest. So that keeps up us up to date. And, you know, you talked about this family, about losing, you know, the idea of, you know, your colleagues and your family when you retire. And that is one of the great things for a volunteer. For instance, this afternoon, uh, we have a group of volunteers that are interested in writing, narrative writing. So we have a narrative writing group. And we're meeting this afternoon at one o'clock. There'll be about 20 of us. And we will sit down and we'll write stuff. We'll critique each other. And we've developed kind of a family around that. And as you said, we actually, we've taken some of the writings that we've done over the past couple of years, and it's been published in a book. It's called, um, it's called Reflections on Medicine and Humanity. And you're right, it's on Amazon and all this stuff. So it's really a great feeling for us. It's so rewarding to feel useful again. 
It really is. I thank you. And I want to just, I, I am so grateful for that, for those opportunities that Maven has afforded me and so many other volunteers. We, we have also, we also have like a lot of us do mentoring. So we have a mentoring group and we meet like, I think it's once every two months, but a group of us mentors will get together by Zoom. And we will talk about what are the difficult issues that we had in the mentoring? What advice do we have in this situation? So I've got a whole new family and I'm so grateful to that and grateful to you. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, after all you said, it's all about relationships and it's all about community. And I think all of us who's practiced medicine over these years has se have seen that the days when you had these very personal relationships with patients have, yeah. have kind of fallen by the board. I mean, you know, we talk about the I patient, E-Y-E -E, versus the I patient, I dot, you know, and more and more as, as eye contact has faded and systems have taken care of people instead of people taking care of people. I think it, it, it's something that those of us who knew how it was value more and more. And I think it, it's something that needs to come back in, into medicine. And insofar as we've said are in the relationship business with these clinicians and among ourselves, uh, I, I think it revitalizes everyone. And as soon to be Vice President Waltz maybe said, it brings back the joy. Yeah, so. it really does. It really does bring the joy and meaning back into our lives that so many people that have retired. And you've talked about, you mentioned the gray tsunami, and I, I am part of that revitalized tsunami. Uh, I'm not very gray, but as you can see, but it's like, it's, yeah, yeah. Lori, I want to just ask you this. So we're, this interview is taking place at seven o'clock in the morning in California time. You're in California. Where in California are you, by the way? In San Francisco. You're in San Francisco. Okay. You're in San Francisco. <laughs> now it's seven o'clock in the morning here. We logged in at 645 just to make sure mechanically was going on. And it turns out, tell us what you did before you logged in at 645. I'm still a full-time obstetrician gynecologist. So I did a C-section and rounded on six patients before before I, I came over. But I do that every morning. But, you know, it, it, it's wonderful to be energized. I, I, I also am deeply committed. And I think everyone who's had a long career realizes that, you know, what gives you the greatest pleasure and fulfillment is feeling like you're helping the people who need it the most. And, you know, I have a practice of patients who are, you know, very well insured and will, you know, do all their diligence and do all their research and help, you know, stay healthy. And sometimes I think make many of their own healthcare decisions and I'm just there to facilitate. But then when you think of the potential you have to help the individuals who really are the grease of our society, we're helping the gardeners and the babysitters and the farm workers whose insurance is poor and the restaurant workers and the construction workers. There are so many people who are vital to our society running. And the idea that you can help them by working with their primary care providers is so fulfilling to me sometimes more than just the face-to-face. -face. I mean, and I have a high bar because I get to deliver babies every day, but I, I enjoy this the most. I feel most fulfilled and accomplished through what the Maven Project has been able to do. And then I happen to be the president of the Health Commission for the city and county of San Francisco. And once again, we have every imaginable element of, of public health we're responsible for, in addition to oversight at our large county hospital and one of the biggest skilled nursing facilities in the country. And that's really, you know, that's the positive part. So as clinicians, retire. And I think these opportunities are there. Maven Project is certainly there. But those give back opportunities are, I think, so fulfilling and gratifying. And that's why I, I love this. That's why I get up at 4.30 so I can make it. I was, was going to ask you, what time do you get into work? So now I know 4.30, you get into work and now you've got another patient. I think you scheduled about. <laughs> I got 31 in here today, but that's because. 31 patients. Oh, okay. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so, so, and, and let me just say this, just to emphasize this once more, because I have heard this so often. And I, when you're in one of these, when you're in one of these safety net clinics and you're a clinician there and you're 
kind of inexperienced, if somebody has a, a problem, it may be a relatively simple problem, but you don't know who to turn to because you can, because your consultant is going to be three months down the road. And I can tell you, this is an absolute fact. It happens over and over again. And with the click of the mouse, you can get in touch with a specialist, 30, 40 years of experience and get their advice and their wisdom. And most of those times, they don't even require that consult. They won't even need that consult that will be able to handle the, that patient right away. And if you've had that happen to you three or four times a day and you're just left in limbo, God, I, and, and you feel terrible for your patient, I mean, that has got to take a toll on physician resilience and, and physician well-being. And imagine just these farm workers and restaurant workers the salt of the earth people, and they have to go home and wonder, oh my God, what does that skin lesion mean? Is that doctor said something about an EKG? And for three months, you're going to wait. It's just extraordinary, I think, what this has done. So let me, but here's, let me ask you this. <laughs> so you are a full-time OBGYN doctor. You're getting up at 4.30 in the morning to do C-sections and see patients in the hospital. I'm not sure. What is your title? What is your title? Too. Yeah. Of the Maven Project. You have, you know, fostered this thing, guided it and so forth. You are the president of the San Francisco Health Society. And I'm, I'm not even going to ask you what else is on your plate. How do you do it? I, how, how do you manage your own work-life balance? Uh, how come you're not frazzled and, and everything? How, how do you do this? Most people have, would have trouble doing one of those things. Well, you love what you do. I always <laughs> laugh. Once I was in this group and we had to say what character in fiction or film we most identified with. And I said the bus on the movie Speed, because if I go any slower than 85 miles an hour, I will implode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I understand that what you're doing gives you a lot of fulfillment, but what do you do to slow down the bus? I mean, for your own well-being. You know, I, I am of the generation that my identity is medicine. And I love it so much. I mean, in OBGYN, you get such joy all the time. I mean, you're with people at this moment of life that they'll never forget. And you get to be a part of it. Yeah. So, you know, that just gives you energy. Yeah. It gives you strength. It gives you energy. You know, I think all doctors have had this experience of think about you never have to wonder why you're getting up in the morning and what you're going to do and what your purpose is. And I think that's so it's really energizing and a privilege, a real yeah. privilege to be able, you know, it's that great thing. You make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. And we've had the privilege in medicine of being able to make lives. And you know, what you're saying is just so contrary to what you're, what you hear today from folks that I mean, because what I hear you saying is it's your passion. I mean, this is what gives you this. This is your calling to be a doctor. This is what gets you up in the morning. My God, I just can't wait to get in and deliver that baby and see the smile on that couple's face that had this baby. I mean, that is the, the passion that you have for doing it. That is your calling. It's not just a career. It's not just a job. And yet so many doctors doing the same, having the same responsibility, the same job as you get up and look at it as, oh my God, it's another day in the chocolate factory with Lucy and Ethel and man, I, you know, and I'm dealing with all the administration and all the EMRs and all this, and I'm burnt out and thing. It's yeah, The burnout is really, I mean, for the younger generation, it's a great worry. Someone once told me this, you know, how medicine has kind of devolved over time and how when we first started we were physicians and our patients were patients. And now we're vendors and our patients are loss units. How can the vendors and the loss units yeah. work together to make uh, it a, a, a better experience for the providers as well as a better health situation for the patients? And you know, what you, br you brought up about access, I think is really important because at least here in San Francisco, it isn't just the underinsured that can't get specialty care. We actually have more volunteers in rheumatology in Maven than there are in the city of San Francisco. I used Maven, and I'll give you a really great example. So 
as I said, you know, in OBGYN, because I've known people for so long, I cross over the double yellow line of primary care more often than I should. I actually did a medical internship at Stanford. Maybe that's why. Who is dumb enough to do two internships? I did one in, in the old days, like 36 on 12 off. So I did one in internal medicine and I did one in OBGYN. But at any rate, I had this 71-year-old patient I've known for years and she had lost weight. She had been to the emergency room with weakness in her extremities. She'd had the whole neurologic workup. Everything was negative. And we didn't know what was wrong. I reached out to a Maven hematologist because she had crazy lab work. Her ferritin mm -hmm. was way elevated. Her C-reactive protein was through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were all these numbers. And I'm not conversant in all of them. I didn't know what they meant. So I reached out to a Maven hematologist and a wonderful Maven rheumatologist who still attends at UC clinics, even though I think he's 90 or 91 now. He stopped biking over the Golden Gate Bridge when he was 87. But <laughs> anyway, I reached out to them and I said, what should I do next? And I literally guided this woman through a whole rule out workup because she could not get into a hematologist. She could never get into a rheumatologist. And finally, and this went on over, over about four week period of time, I even sent her to the emergency room to get abdominal scanning because I was worried she had a malt lymphoma and each thing ruled out. At the end of the day, the only thing she needed to do after I'd done these Maven consults was to get a temporal artery biopsy, which one of my colleagues in ophthalmology did. And sure enough, she has giant cell arteritis. Wow. And, you know, she would still be suffering and still not have gotten in because I tried to pull strings to get her in sooner to a hematologist or a rheumatologist and it was to no avail. So a very complex, you know, CPC in the New England Journal case, which she really would have been, mm. ended up um, having a diagnosis and a treatment within four weeks. And this is what, and, and a well-insured woman, and this is what the Maven volunteers do for patients who don't know where to turn and many times don't come to a clinic until they are extremely ill and then can only come once because of work obligations and child care and transportation mm. barriers. You know, we have a clinic that's a wonderful clinic here in San Francisco, Mission Neighborhood Health Center. They are walking distance from San Francisco General, which is where, you know, they would go for inpatient care. But often you can't reach a, a, a specialist at the general in a timely way. At the general, we have T, what they call TNAA, time to next available appointment. And it's something that, that, that we, are, we work so hard, this is part of my health commission in, uh, hat, to try to increase the, uh, decrease the time and increase the access. And it's almost impossible to do that. So Maven Project fills so many gaps. It is an opportunity for retirees and even physicians who have left clinical practice, maybe you're in industry, but really want to be able to do something for patients. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to stabilize the primary care workforce. And it's well known based on, among other things, a blue ribbon panel led by Janet Napolitano and sponsored by the California Healthcare Foundation about the crisis in the physician shortage and provider shortage that is looming. And they recognize that nurse practitioners and physician uh, assistants will be the backbone of primary care, not just for the underserved, but for many other individuals as well. I'm sure many of you have experienced that where the PA or NP is the individual who sees you. So drill down to the you know less well-paid clinics. And you can imagine that it will be these individuals who are relatively undertrained, but but are put into a clinical situation because of the great need and the dearth of, of clinicians. And here Maven Project is to, to, you know, make them be able to practice at the top of their license. So what, what do we do? We help people practice at the top of their license and at the top of their humanity. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's said that so well, the top of their practice and top of their humanity. And that, that's really what's it about. And I said, that's extraordinary. I mean, here you're in this high practice clinic and you're having trouble getting people seen to be a specialist. You yourself called on a Maven volunteer and you mentioned Dr. Schulman giving this talk on hypertension. I, that was a great talk. I listened to it and I myself had a question on hype, my own hypertension and I emailed him and talked to him and I got some great advice. <laughs> you know, that's another advantage. We, we volunteers, it's like a family. We, we have like, 
How many volunteers are there, by the way? How many? How many we do we have? Three hundred and sixty-three specialties. Obviously, we don't deploy them all. But yeah. you know, I have to put it in a plug for Jill Einstein, who's for from the beginning yeah. has been the head of physician engagement, and she's an internist who stepped back when she had her family, and she's been absolutely wonderful. Oh my gosh, she's together. fantastic! And also, the other thing we did we shouldn't overlook is an amazing infectious diseases physician named yeah. Debbie Gold, who was retired from Kaiser. She gave the most remarkable lectures about COVID weekly with yes. up-to-date data. She literally scoured the planet getting the latest research, the latest thinking. And at, just to give you a sense, not only did we have some donors who listened to her lectures every week and logged on. But she, at, at the height of the pandemic, she had nearly 100 people listening to her talks. And then she'd bring in some other infectious diseases individuals. You know, Seattle is an incredible infectious disease division, always has. And one mm -hmm. of the physicians who had been a professor there came, uh, came along and, and they would have some panels. But I think, you know, she got many clinics through one of the most trying times in medicine yes. that, that's happened in, in our lifetimes. And yeah. You know, this is the caliber and, and the commitment and the effort that our volunteers put forth. Yeah, she's fantastic. And so, Lori, let me ask you, you mentioned about donors, about our volunteers. What would you like people that are listening in to hear that listening into this podcast that maybe they're near retirement or maybe not re in, in retirement? What can they do to help this project along? Well, thank you. That's a great question. We need funding. And mm -hmm. I think donors are very important to us. We are mostly funded by philanthropy. In fact, some of the clinics that are themselves decently funded, some of the federally qualified health centers pay a nominal fee. And then it's complete access. So unlike these commercial organizations that provide consultations where it's a per encounter fee, it is basically as much as you need, as often as you need with all our services available. And for free and charitable clinics, it's free of charge. So, you know, in order to develop the platform, improve our platform, which is really our heartbeat, it's our way of communicating, to be able to, we pay for malpractice and we obviously do background checks and make sure all our volunteers are, are up to date. You know, all of that takes manpower and it takes funding. So the smallest amount really means a lot to us. It's fascinating with grants because we've discovered, although we are in the midst of hopefully having some data to improve our grant opportunities, there are many grantors that want to study what to do about healthcare access and healthcare for the underserved. And we have a solution. Yeah. And so it's frustrating because, you know, they fund thinking, not they fund the, I think it's who makes the decisions, right? They fund the world of ideas and we are the product. So <laughs> as far as we can get funding, you know, that would, that's fantastic. We love volunteers and especially people with expertise who want to serve. And we have primary care providers who actually only do mentoring. In other words, if people are afraid that they may not be the most up-to-date in their specialty, you'd be surprised at just the tools you can give primary care providers through just the art of medicine and the wisdom you, we've all accumulated through, you know, through the years of caring for patients and practicing mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. And so those are two things that come to mind. And all, you know, the volunteer option, as well as, of course, the donation are all on our website. All right. And the website is, what's the website? www.mavenproject.org. Okay, folks, check it out. Because as you so eloquently say, Lori, you know, people are having commissions. They're talking about, they have ideas, they're throwing around it. But Maven Project is, is, is not just talking the talk, we're walking the walk. We are already giving so much benefit to so many people. I know I'm going to, I know that you have to get back and deliver some more babies and do all this and that. So we'll close. And I just want to thank you for, you know, your vision in founding this organization for your inspiration and for your leadership in it. It's made such a difference, such a difference to so many, to 30 million American patients who are in these underserved clinics, who are now able to get advice and help on their problem without waiting three to four months that maybe something could have gone wrong in them. Maybe they're just living with the anxiety and so much. And you've given so much comfort and help to these clinicians that are struggling in these underserved clinics. And now they're able to help their patients 
not having to sit on them for three to four months and able to, to help them write so much. And also you've given so much to folks like me, retired folks who now have find feeling useful and feeling that we're recovering after retirement, that we've lost so much, that we're recovering the joy and the meaning of what we did and the passion, as you've mentioned yourselves. And I want to just thank you so much on behalf of the clinicians, the patients, and the volunteers who work with Maven Project. Thank you, Dr. Lori Green. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege. Doctors dedicate our lives to caring for others. It's time someone took care of us. Visit PatternLife.com to simplify your path to peace of mind. PatternLife.com, simplifying your insurance journey. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.